Right now, we will be uh, watching a video uh, for Dr. Ilya Nekult. He is the chief data scientist. Uh, he is the chief data scientist for um, the German Cooperation uh, Ministry. Um, Dr. Nickel, over to you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be with you, even if only virtually, for this 2023 UN World Data Forum. This is a vibrant exchange of ideas, and you have picked a vibrant session. I would like to start off by expressing my appreciation to UNDP for not only being a valuable partner over the years, but also for being so strong in human-centric digital development all over the world. UNDP's role is more imminent than ever as we face those grave challenges with achieving the sustainable development agenda. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Allow me to state the obvious this one time. Data and statistics are indispensable for sound policy decisions. Indispensable for that future that is to come. The scale and magnitude of the challenges we face today require sound policies, sound decisions that are transparent, that are inclusive, leaving no one behind, and that are rooted in evidence. This is now widely recognized at the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development and also in the German government by most public administration practitioners. Thus, we strive to create an enabling environment that systematically integrates data in all aspects of our policy making. And recognizing how important this is, I am happy to tell you that all German ministries have now established new data competence centers. We call them data labs. Our BMZ data lab is working vigorously towards building and improving the infrastructure processes and capabilities that can put data driven policies to work in Germany. That being said, we probably all recognize that we have quite some road ahead of us and have not even tapped into the full potential of what data has to offer. We are currently all watching how the newest of the technologies arises, which was planted and grown on data, artificial intelligence. If we let the processes to use data, how are we going to learn to train AI models? How can we learn ethical alignment, which may well become essential for AI regulation? All over the world, and Germany is no exception, the progress of adopting data-driven processes is slow and uneven. We know, of course, that many partner countries, at least within the German Development Corporation, report data as an underutilized resource. There is a long list of challenges that can explain this reality. Some examples, struggling with accessing data, limited data capabilities and the resources needed for analysis lack of legislative frameworks that risk wrongful usage, data skepticism within different entities of national administrations, as well as different levels of infrastructural advancements within and across different countries. More importantly, there has always been a long-standing divide between the data producers, such as the national statistics offices, and the private sector, and the data consumers like the policymakers, who are tasked with making decisions and developing policies that are backed by evidence. This brings me to the questions of today's sessions. How can we realize the potential of data-informed policymaking? How can we, as policymakers, ensure an effective and integrated approach to achieve the SDGs through better data and evidence? How can we equip ourselves to best leverage all those opportunities that come with new innovative data sources. Against the backdrop of these questions, I am happy to now see the data to policy navigator come to light. This is a result of a close cooperation between UNDP and GIZ with, of course, BMZ support. Without giving away too much yet, I had the pleasure to follow the development of this product over the last couple of months, and I was happy to see 
how it incorporates policymakers' perspective. Their needs, interests, challenges are being kept at the center of the overall aim to strengthen data ecosystems for better decision making. I would also like to take this opportunity to add that upholding data ethics and data privacy are important for data driven decision making. In the fast changing digital information systems we live in, we cannot afford to overlook these aspects to ensure individual freedom. Of course, the navigator also takes this into consideration. Lastly, and most importantly, I would like to give a huge thanks to our panelists today. Your insight and experiences as experts and practitioners, which I enjoy really, are extremely valuable in further refining the navigator, as well as shaping the future dialogue on this important topic. I am very excited by the attendance today, both in the room and virtually. It reflects great willingness to engage and contribute to our effort. Now, finally, this is a process of mutual learning. Germany also participates in this data policy endeavor, uh, and we are learning a lot from this experience. And now I'm very, I very much look forward to the session and the discussions. What is there to say? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ilya, who I know that he's tuned in to our live stream, um, despite being very early in Germany. Now it's time for our panel. So I would like to invite our esteemed guests and speakers to join me on stage. First, uh, before we start, allow me to introduce our esteemed panelists. So, um, to start with, we have His Excellency uh, Alexei Buzo, Minister of Labor and Social Protection from the Republic of Moldova. Minister Buzo has decades of experience in management of public policies and nonprofit organizations and was the executive director of the Partnership for Development Center before being appointed as the Minister of Labor and Social Protection early this year. Welcome, Your Excellency. Thank you. Next, we have Professor Xiao, Wang, Xiao Jun Wang, Dean of the School of uh, Statistics at uh, Jianmin University of China. Her main research interests include more Uganda's Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. He also served as the Regional Management Associate with Citigroup in Kenya and Tanzania. Welcome, Tony. Last but not least, our fourth panelist, Ms. Dima Al-Khatib, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us in person today, but will be answering the first question through her uh, pre-recorded video remarks. Dima is the director of, U of the UN Office of for South uh, to South Cooperation. She has more than 25 years of leadership and management experience in several duty stations, uh, and she was previously uh, serving as the UNDP resident representative in the Republic of Moldova. A warm welcome to all of you. To set the scene, I would like to ask each of the speakers to tell us how has data informed policies, or rather is informing policies in each of your contexts. So let's start with Moldova. Over to you, Your Excellency. Thank you. It's just a small remark. It's, it's so strange to be addressed as Excellency, so I would say, Alexei, <laughs> I try to keep it informal as much as possible. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and it's, um, you know, it's so strange. Now I'm a policymaker. I used to be you, like the, the one doing the analysis and pushing guys like me. And, um, you know, the, the data without the decision maker considering it is nothing. And unfortunately, you know, there's so much potential. I, I've looked at different cases, and I was like, wow, we can use this. Oh, I can use this. And we as decision makers, we, we just don't use it. And I think um, maybe one consideration for the next forum is to invite more people like me just to be, uh, you know, be more aware of the immense potential. I think it's um, very, very important. And 
I think what happened in, in Moldova, the way we try to take on data uh, to make it part of our decision-making process, is that we faced a huge, huge crisis, uh, meaning the energy crisis. You know, the, the price of energy in Moldova increased eight times, eightfold. And of course, that impacted all Moldovan households, including the, those uh, with, low, on, uh, with low income. So the decision was made to d develop a scheme to compensate the, uh, the energy bills, uh, but sh the, the, the scheme should be very targeted. So of course we needed data on the income of households and then data on the energy consumption. So we, I think uh, b because we were in crisis and we, we started to work on, the, on this program uh, in the, spring, in the summer of the last year, we had about three to four months to get this done. So I would say very, very sh short amount of time, and we were not sure that we would be able to get it done, to have a functional uh, program. But we, were, we managed to, one, get data from all the public institutions. I think that's an issue of sharing, that you know, even within uh, government or within the ministries, we have issues with sharing data. We got data from private sector, the energy suppliers, and we got data from citizens, and we're able to have a targeted uh, compensation scheme, and we were able to save money. I think if uh, we would implement a non-targeted program, it will cost at least four times uh, uh, bigger, and we've done an opinion uh, poll among the, the users, and about 65% considered uh, the scheme to be fair which in this polarized society in Moldova and the world, it's, it's a huge, huge achievement. Now the question is, this was a crisis, and you know, we put uh, our kind of egos aside, our silos' interests aside, and the question for me as a minister is now, like, can we take the lesson learned and have it as a normal rule rather than um, you know, something that happened in an emergency? And I think this is now we, we try to... Um, learn the lessons with the help of the UNDP office in, in, in Moldova and see how we can, how we can do this without, within the other programs. That, as you well aware, there are so many programs that they go on inertia. Like uh, path dependency is the rule in my ministry and I think in most of the, uh, the, the governments. And I think the, the idea of taking insights, um, understanding you know, what is the issue and how we can better address it, it's, it's, is the key, and I think you know, never let a crisis go to waste. And I, I'm really glad that we we did this. Now it's time to kind of make it a kind of a normal. Fascinating. Thank you, Alexey. Um, Tony, over to you. Thank you, uh, and a great pleasure to be here. Um, really interesting question, and really from the outset, I want to say that a number of the uh, issues raised by the by Alexi resonate uh, with what I'm going to say. So that's a little disclaimer. Um, in terms of the, um, I mean, two things. On one hand, the cooperation with GIZ and other partners. Uh, I think it's it's important to start off with with really part of the puzzle, which is that data means many things to many people. Uh, and I think in 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 the spirit of specificity, uh, our work really looks at three dimensions. Two that speak. Uh, to really the supply side, and here really the question of governance and architecture. Uh, uh, and I think just in the context of crisis, the story there I think is that it takes a crisis uh, and that perfect is the enemy of the good. Uh, and no clearer example came through than COVID, both COVID response and in the case of Kenya, uh, drought. Um, I think fundamentally looking uh, at another part of the supply side, which is capabilities, is also important. I think we're working um, in UNDP in Kenya to help the digital skilling of public sector. Public sector is the vector, the primary vector for development, needs a workforce in 2023 uh, that is AI fluent, that has a, a grasp from a regulatory perspective uh, of both the challenges and the opportunities. And finally, from the demand side, the question of accountability that given the one minute sign that was showed, I will uh, take up in my next answer. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Over to you, Professor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, let me uh, share some experience of uh, China in China. Uh, 
about the data informing policy making. In, the, in China, the main open data is uh, from the official data from the minister, uh, from the uh, National Bureau of Statistics, on local Bureau of Statistics, uh, on some uh, statistic department in ministries. Yeah. Um, the data used by the policy making on also uh, some researchers in universities on some uh, consult consulting organizations. Uh, they uh, use the uh, data to do some conduct some uh, simulations on predictive analysis, then uh, make some conclusions and uh, give policymakers uh, suggestions and advice um, directly on uh, indirectly by their published articles on uh, books. Yeah. Um, here, let me uh, 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 let me uh, give an example of data I, I involved in, uh, about data informing uh, policy making um, in, in social security reform uh, policy uh, option in China. I know Alex is from the. Uh, labor and uh, uh, social protection uh, uh, minister. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, uh, China has gradually uh, established a social security system that covers all kind of workers, including the formal and uh, informal, and the uh, uh, public and the uh, private employees and the uh, uh, urban uh, urban residents and the rural uh, residents step by step by step, and. Yes, it is, it is very important to maintain the system um, fairness and uh, solvency and the long-term financial sustainability. Yeah, it is, uh, so it is uh, very important to do some uh, data analysis to give some uh, uh, support, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I, uh, my research team, a lead, uh, interested by the Ministry of Finance. Uh, they leveraged actuarial models and some participation real, participation real data uh, to do micro simulations and long-term predictive analysis, uh, yes, to monitor uh, the different policy options. Uh, it is different outcomes, it's different uh, influence by the by the system, yeah. Uh, so this is, I think, is a very good uh, examples uh, for data informing uh, policy making. I, I just we, we just gave the advice or some suggestions to the governors to make a policy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Brilliant. you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor. There's a lot of follow-up questions, and I'm sure the room is burning to ask uh, their own questions. But before we do that, maybe we can play the clip from uh, Dima Al-Khatib um, with her answer to this question. Dear colleagues and participants, it's my great pleasure to join you today on behalf of the UN Office for South-South Cooperation at this UNDP GIZ event on Data to Policy in Action. Allow me to express my gratitude for the invitation, and I do apologize for not being able to attend in person. Data-informed policymaking has played a crucial role in the successes of South-South cooperation by enabling evidence-based decision-making, resource allocation, and tailored interventions. By leveraging data-driven decision-making processes, countries in the Global South have been able to make better inform choices, identify opportunities for collaboration, and implement effective policies to address complex and intractable challenges. For example, the joint monitoring and evaluation mechanisms between Brazil, Ethiopia, and Malawi allows for sharing of data on agricultural and rural development to identify key challenges and opportunities leading to better targeted initiatives. The India-Brazil-South Africa Trilateral Initiative uses data to track the progress of projects in areas such as agriculture, education, health, and social development, thereby allowing for timely adjustments and improved outcomes. Through the India-UN Fund, managed by the UNOSSC, seven Pacific Island countries were supported to strengthen their climate early warning systems by enabling them to capture and share climate data through a common platform. Another India-UN fund initiative supported the government of Moldova to improve the availability of administrative data for tracking progress of the population and development agenda within the framework of the SDGs. 
in my previous capacity in Moldova, UNDP was working very closely with the government to advance the data for policy development agenda. Data-informed policy making has also facilitated regional integration efforts. For example, the Southern African Development Community has leveraged data-driven decision making to harmonize policies and create a single market for goods and services, leading to increased trade, investments, and regional development. The Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility uses data to provide insurance coverage and assist member countries in disaster risk management, contributing to the resilience of the region. Colleagues, to further enhance South-South and Triangle cooperation towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, countries and partners must work together to improve data literacy, data infrastructure, knowledge exchange, capacity building, and forge regional and global partnerships. Among others, UNOSSC promotes, coordinates, and supports South-South and Triangle cooperation globally. It provides a platform for sharing good practices, exchanging knowledge, and developing innovative solutions to common development challenges. For example, the South-South Galaxy Digital Interactive Platform has over 550 registered institutions and serves as a consolidated one-stop shop South-South development solution platform for all partners to utilize. The joint UNDP, UNOSSE, South South Global Thinkers Initiatives serves as a platform for think tanks networks from the Global South to exchange knowledge, pool multidisciplinary expertise, conduct research, and engage in policy dialogues on South South and triangular cooperation. The UNOSSC Cities Project has conducted several online capacity development and knowledge exchanges towards the establishment of an online community of practice, cluster of cities, local and sectoral practitioners. UNOSSC Youth for South Empower Fellowship initiatives has supported a recipient from Bangladesh to, based on learning from the Indian scientist, advance her research in repurposing anti-malarial drug compounds. By utilizing these UNOSSC and other resources, countries can enhance the effectiveness of data-driven policies and foster greater collaboration within the context of South-South and triangular cooperation to be able to respond to the current poly crisis. UNOSSC stands ready to support relevant follow-up efforts to this event and explore partnerships opportunities. Brilliant. Well, we can open the floor for questions. So if anybody has any questions, please just raise your hand and we have our volunteers ready to mic you up. Please. Hi, um, I'm Sayonara. I come from the Danish Institute for Human Rights, and I've been fascinated already by what has been said um, and looking forward to seeing the uh, data to policy navigator in real life. Um, I have a question for Alexei, uh, a follow-up from what you said on the pool of data that you gathered uh, to inform the energy price crisis there, specifically on, you know, the use that you mentioned also, you use data from civil society. So I wanted to hear a little bit more on how was the interaction of that data with the data that you also gathered from the private sector and uh, the ministries, and if there are some insights from the use of that type of data into this process as well that you would mm -hmm. like to, to highlight to us today. Thank you. Yeah. Please. So, so the idea was to, we had to clarify two issues. Uh, so the, the income of the household and uh, how much they, con they consumed in, in the, you know, in the past. To, because we had we established five levels of how uh, vulnerable they are to the price of energy. So one point was that the citizens will log in into a portal. They share with us the data. Then we will cross check this with the um, data from energy supplies, so electricity, gas, you know, thermal energy. Um, then we'll have cross-check this with other data sources from pub, uh, public sectors. So for instance, um, you know, social, uh, social payments. If they're pensioner, you know, what's the, where's their pension? Or if they receive a salary, how much they, they contribute? So we, we can understand what is the income stemming from the salary and so forth. You know, if they have properties, we could uh, know this. So we use all these data points to make sure that we, one, target most vulnerable. Second, we reduce fraud. 
you know, because some sometimes people tend to, you know, get into the to the portal, overstate the or understate the income, and and so forth. So this was the um, uh, kind of the process. And you know, what's still fascinating to me is that we get we got this done in three months, and. Um, the idea was that when we launched the system, of course, there were issues. We were, I was afraid that the system will crash. It, it did not. And at, in one week, we had 10,000 queries. And, you know, we had to deal, you know, the, um, uh, the, the people responsible to respond to all the queries. They, they were overwhelmed. We had to deploy stuff within the ministry to, to deal with this. But it was, you know, the, the idea was that everyone was, under, you know, understanding and it Everyone knew that, as you mentioned, never let the perfect to be the enemy. You have to kind of bake in, price in some level of failure that, you know, the system is not perfect, but you may be uh, agile and, uh, you know, you can kind of improve as, uh, as you go. We did not have the um, inputs from civil society, I mean citizens, that, that was the, the, the kind of the, the, the third part. Um, yeah, so that's the... And it's still, again, um, for for a country like ours, it now this uh, uh, this database is the most sophisticated database that we have. Now we uh, other ministries are trying to learn from us and kind of okay, what what type of data do you have? How how did you manage to integrate data from on properties and with income from the you know uh, treasury and, and so forth? So that's the that's a crisis we'll do for you and some political will. Brilliant. Any other questions? Please. Thank you very much, speakers, for your brief uh, information. Uh, so uh, I'm Khyomidin Tashrifzoda from NSO of Tajikistan. Uh, my questions uh, to His Excellency, Mr. Alexei, uh, as you are have a great experience uh, in Moldova, in Ministry of Labor. So my question relating to the migration and remittances. Uh, so uh, as far you know, uh, there is uh, between countries there is this, this discrepancy with, uh, on remittances data. So how you how uh, Moldova come up with this question, and also another question from this uh, and uh, the share of uh, remittances in GDP, how it's calculated in Moldova. Mm. Uh, if you share your uh, experience, it will be great for us. Thank you. Maybe I can also follow that up with a, uh, another question to the other speakers to, uh, and then line them up and then mm. we can go from there. So I had a, a follow-up question to Tony um, regarding the public-private partnerships that UNDP Kenya is uh, working on. Um, and uh, we would, I think it would be interesting to know what is one lesson learned and a, or a best practice that you could share with us um, uh, on managing these partnerships. Um, and I have another question to uh, the professor, um, and I think it's related to the work that you mentioned uh, with the National Bureau of Statistics. Um, if you can share with us um, how, uh, how this collaboration, this uh, academic uh, and, and public uh, collaboration uh, is working, and um, if there are other lessons learned for other academics in the room uh, who can um, learn from that partnership. So maybe let's start with His Excellency, and then uh, we move on. So I, we, we have different data sources. One is the National Bank, but they capture the, the bank transfers in a way. We have a household budget surveys, and I think for me, this is the, the key data point because it allows us to understand, for instance, the share of income for the bottom 20 percentile of income scale. How, how much they, do they receive in terms of remittances? And for instance, we can see maybe if there's a crisis in Europe where we have, um, you know, uh, Moldovan citizens working, maybe the rural areas, some young families can be uh, impacted because the share of the uh, remittances within the household budget will will diminish, and then we can maybe think of of different uh, programs to 
to support that or to complement the, the loss of income. What we see, for instance, uh, is that um, households where, uh, with older people receive a small share of remittances and households with people with disabilities. So that's, that's an issue that, you know, the kind of poverty reduction story in Moldova has been mostly about remittances. And this helped us to kind of increase um, standards of living, include, especially in the rural areas. But there are some households, like people with disabilities, elderly, they benefit less. So we need to, again, as a Minister of Labor and Social Protection, I need to have this insight to make sure that, you know, we design our social protection programs and interventions with this in mind. Thanks. Tony. Thank you very much. Maybe a very short preface uh, to reg regarding the, the problem we're responding to through uh, our public-private partnership. And I think it relates to the fact that you know, public sector decision-making is, is fundamentally different from private sector decision-making. And in a sense, uh, I think for a range of reasons, treating data that informs public sector policy has to be looked at as a public good. Uh, I say that because we have something we observe uh, that, that Alexei and others have referred to, which is a chronic problem with regards to data that informs public sector policy of underfunding, right? You don't get that with the private sector. The private sector will invest in data, they will use it, and they will demonstrate to their shareholders, not so in public sector. And secondly, the question of undersharing, right? I think sharing uh, within uh, public sector actors and across uh, is also a problem that we don't see in the private sector in spite uh, of private sector operators working in competition with others. That means that within their organizations they share. So moving from that, um, really through uh, our partnership with, with GIZ uh, and others, uh, we have essentially two, um, two, two major uh, public-private partnerships. The first seeks um, to basically strengthen institutional capacities of sub-national actors in Kenya uh, around the use of spatial data to inform uh, water governance and water mapping. Uh, and in a sense, the, the, the kind of, in, a, in the spirit of dealing with the public good, uh, the, the, the problem we're responding to there is one of institutional capacities. So there we're using um, a different approaches. So on one hand, for example, uh, we're working at combining non-traditional data I mentioned spatial data, traditional data such as metrological um, and, and related instruments, but also citizen-centric. And this maybe takes me directly um, to the main insights. And one of the insights, if we're to look at this as a public good provision problem, is that of sustainability, right? Secondly, is that of inclusion. Uh, and I think concretely, uh, what we've seen is we must find uh, or strike a balance with regards to private sector engagement, right, with regards to providing data sustainably for public uh, sector decision-making in water governance. Similarly, uh, the question of citizens' engagement. And I think having citizens uh, and civic actors at the center uh, of the solution is key. So maybe to conclude, um, the question um, of data, I think, cannot be divorced from the broader problem of supplying public good in increasingly resource-scarce environments. Brilliant. Preach, preach. Yeah. Over to you, Professor. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yes, uh, there, there are very different ways to strengthen the cooperation between the government and the academia. And I just gave some examples in, in China. Uh, some universities and the government cooperated to support a research center. Uh, like in Renmin University, in our university, we have uh, MBS, National Bureau of Statistics, and uh, Renmin University of, uh, of, of, of China uh, cooperated uh, data research center. Uh, th this center is a, like a platform uh, for the researchers to uh, assess the uh, micro data to do research. The, the center also organized some seminars, uh, discussions, uh, with professors and uh, uh, governors. Yeah. I, I think this is a, a very good way to facilitate the communication between academia and the, the government. Uh, another generally in China is government contract with the expert as consultant to provide advice uh, or government provide financial support for some research project they interested in. Um, 
This project often accompanied by the data provided by the by government, like I, I mentioned, uh, I, I have had a chance to did some uh, research project uh, funded by the Ministry of Finance and National Bureau of Statistics, uh, Labor and Social Security, uh, etc. Uh, so I believe the uh, appointing uh, consulting ex uh, expert by the government on entrusting academia to carry out research project is a, is a very effective way to strengthen the cooperation between university and the, the government. Uh, I can give another uh, example. Um, is my school have a, a high level talent training program uh, cooperated with National Bureau of Statistics. Uh, in this program, young trainees selected by the NBS uh, received instruction in the class. Uh, they also have class in uh, uh, and uh, uh, supervised by both a professor and uh, officer uh, to do a project. Yeah, uh, this model uh, collaboration along both the academia and the government official to work very close uh, together to identify and tackle the real world uh, challenge. So I believe this is a very effective way to improve the collaboration between academia and the, the uh, government. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're running uh, out of time, unfortunately, uh, but really very interesting and unique perspectives. Um, and I think uh, Kenya and Moldova, specifically, we have uh, them as one of the initial countries where we're rolling in the navigator that we will hear uh, about in a second. But um, I want to thank our esteemed speakers. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you so much for your questions. One of the best things about this uh, forum is that we have a chance to continue the conversation outside um, the, the formal setting. So um, thank you again. And uh, yeah, <laughs> let's give a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And now, um, the long-awaited moment, uh, we have the Navigator demo um, coming up. And I would like to introduce my colleagues, Alena Klatt and uh, Giti Patwal. Alena is uh, with our team at uh, UNDP, and Giti is with GIZ. The floor is yours. Distinguished guests, colleagues, please meet Santi Mulyani. Santi works at the Ministry of Labor, where she leads a department and in that function oversees the design and the implementation of a set of policies. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, the labor market in her country has seen several challenges. One of that challenge is a high and rising youth unemployment, which I'm sure many of you have seen as well. That high youth unemployment leads to high, high rates of crime and also a general decrease in societal well-being. So she got asked by her supervisor to develop a new policy. As part of the COVID-19 pandemic, however, she also remembers there were actually quite a few new data sources, such as mobile data and social media data, that helped to develop policies reducing the spread of COVID-19. So she wonders, is there also a way to use new policies, uh, new data for new policies in the labor market? And while she wonders, her colleague recommends to her the data to policy navigator. So she goes on data to policy .org, where she finds guidance on how to integrate data into any policy area. She also finds a collection of use cases from across the sectors and across the globe. She's interested in a very specific set of use cases on economic development. So she uses the filter function to check for those that are specifically related to that topic. Each use case has an executive summary at the beginning. We are all busy. 
So these summarize the most important information, such as type of data that was used, as well as the challenge, the approach, and the benefit of that specific use case. Santi is interested in more, so she finds detailed step-by-step -step guidance specifically tailored to policymakers. In that guidance, she can also find interactive material as well as an outlook to where that country is heading next with that policy. There's also additional case resources available if she wants to continue reading. Okay. Yeah, we're not done yet. So, um, so now Santi has basically, she's gone through the navigator, she has seen various examples, use cases on ideas that are working in different countries, different contexts, but are very similar to the challenges that she's facing. She is feeling a bit inspired now to use more data in policy making processes specific to youth and employment, but is a bit unclear on where she could start. So for a bit of a background, she uh, has some basic knowledge of data analysis. However, uh, she's not a data expert. Uh, as a policymaker, she has dealt with administrative data in the past, but uh, she's seeing that even within her colleagues right now, data is something still viewed as something too technical, uh, and there is resistance to using it a lot. Now she has several questions with her. Where to begin? Uh, what kind of data can she access? How can she access this data? Uh, and most importantly, how can she use this data and use it more responsibly? So in the Data to Policy Navigator, she finds a step-by-step -step guide. Um, so this step-by-step -step guide uh, takes her to the process uh, of how to integrate data. So it starts with problem definition, uh, goes on to access and analysis of data, and concludes with turning that data into policies. She also comes across some overarching subjects, for example, on fostering a culture for using data in policy making, which she immediately relates to her own challenges. She's at a starting stage, she decides to dig deeper into problem definition, and specifically, the Map Your Data ecosystem piece piques her interest in this. Right now, as you can see, she's already able to see where she is in the process and what comes next. Within the data ecosystem mapping piece, she has a very practical tool that will take her to how different stakeholders are collecting data, what kind of data they're collecting, and what are the gaps that, they, that she can identify in the collection as well as dissemination of this data to uh, different uh, policymakers. While this is already on Navigator pretty straightforward, there's also linked to various resources that she can use actually to implement this uh, tool in a very comprehensive way. Lastly, there are also exa examples, for example, in this Vietnam and Mexico on how this tool was actually used in different countries in different contexts. Yeah. So, we, uh, there's a bit more. So now, uh, Santi is just becoming a bit confident that this is where she might want to start. Um, while she knows that there's a lot of decisions to be made and a lot of discussions to be done, she is sure that she can get some stakeholders together in the room to start this process. Uh, but there's a question of how could Santi really decide this is where to start and how were basically the topics and subtopics in the Data to Policy Navigator designed for policymakers like Santi to basically associate uh, at, at particular points. So the question is why and how did we actually develop this navigator? We interviewed about 19 policymakers and experts from different sectors and around the globe and also conducted further research. While there were many takeaways, two of them stood out. Number one, there are actually already quite a few resources out there specifically for national statistics offices and also a couple of specific resources for policymakers. However, what we observed is lacking is this more comprehensive resource. The second one is also that policymakers are often already very convinced of the idea of actually using new data, but they find it a bit difficult to know where to start and how to implement it. So that's where Santi comes in. We developed that persona that you just saw and worked with developers, designers, and an expert panel to which we are very grateful to develop exactly this resource. What is happening next? 
what you see here is just the better version. Um, and actually, in line with what has been mentioned at the panel, uh, we try to not be perfectionists, but rather go out with the product early and are very grateful for your feedback and any thoughts that you have. You can find the feedback button on the website just on top, so please feel free to share. We will incorporate your feedback and then launch the full version in summer this year. So please stay tuned. Okay. Thank you so much, Giti and Elena. Um, a lot of work and sleepless nights have gone into this. Um, and again, we're very grateful and very much looking forward to your feedback. Now um, it is time to hear our closing remarks from our final speaker. Uh, Bjorn Richter is the Head of Digital Transformation Cluster of Global and Sector Programs at GIZ, and he is joining us also uh, through pre-recorded remarks that we will hear now. Dear Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I want to start by thanking our esteemed panel for being here and sharing the insights, and I want to congratulate the entire team behind the Navigator the experts that advised us and the policymakers whom we invited and informed in the development process. The data to policy navigator stands out in its target audience, the policymakers, their needs and challenges being of utmost importance in the development of this product. Through the practical guidance and resources that it offers, we hope that it will make working with data easier for policymakers and mobilize further collaboration between decision makers and data experts. In the end, we want this so we can design better and more robust policies for people as we have seen in the use cases that Alana presented. But today is nothing but the beginning. I'm personally very excited to see what the fully developed version will bring to the table. We plan to officially launch the final version of the Navigator this July, along with a global data to policy network dedicated to mid and senior level government executives and policymakers, accelerating exchange on the subject. I would like to echo as well the call for participation that the UN Office for South-South Cooperation has already made. Through this forum, we are hopeful that we can find more allies in our mission towards global digital transformation and mainstreaming data and form policymaking. I also would like to take the opportunity to reflect on some of the things that have been said on the panel. First and foremost, I would like to congratulate his Excellency Alexei Buzou for the measures taken by the government of Moldova and mainstreaming data and foreign policy making across all ministries and government agencies, even in dire times. This is indeed not an easy thing. I also resonate completely with the challenges faced by Kenyan policymakers on this front. Many of our partners have often spoken of data as an underutilized resource and we have been privy to the struggles of data gaps, accessibility, and usability. I hope we can start to change this by improving uptake of resources, such as the data to policy navigator, that are especially built on policy maker perspective, as well as the needs. We invite you to take a deeper look at the navigator's better version and share with us your hard questions, feedback, ideas, and use case to improve. Help us make this a truly reliable resource to our colleagues around the world. Therefore, there will be a QR code available to join our mailing list, staying in touch, and stay up to date with Navigator's update. This list will be the nucleus of the community that we would like to build. Before I give the floor back to Halim to close the session, I just want to once again thank our esteemed panelists. His Excellency, Alexei Buzur, Professor Wang Zhao Jun, Anthony Nogareno, and Dima Al Khadi for their remarkable inputs. Lastly, and most importantly, I would like to thank UNDP and the Chief Digital Officer for sharing this vision with us and for the great collaboration on this important agenda. I hope that we can, together, continue to mobilize more stakeholders and implement such effective partnership to make inclusive digital transformation a reality. Thanks again, and with this, I pass on to Halle. Thank you, Bjorn. 
With that, we conclude our event. I want to remind everyone with our QR code, please share with us your feedback and comments. And once again, a huge thank you to our host country, the incredible production team from UNDESA and the China National Bureau of Statistics, our volunteers, um, and everyone that's behind uh, the scenes. Um, and finally, our esteemed panelists, thank you so much for all your insights and your inputs. And to everyone who joined us here um, in person and online, thank you so much. You've been an incredible audience. And until next time.